Good evening, I'm H. Wayne Wilson and you are watching At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. If you were to pick one industry in our country that is facing the maximum amount of change, which one would you, of course, the healthcare industry. We all know that with the Affordable Care Act and locally with an affiliation that has occurred. And we're going to be talking about affordable care in just a moment after we talk about the affiliation between Proctor and Methodist. And we'll give you the proper titles of those new units in just a moment after I introduce to you Colleen Kennedy. And Colleen is the president of Advocate Broman Medical Center in Bloomington and also the president of Advocate Eureka Eureka Hos Hospital. Advocate Eureka Hospital Correct. in, of course, in Eureka. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And across the table is Debbie Simon. And Debbie also oversees a couple of units. Uh, she is the president and CEO of Unity Point Health Methodist. Did I, I get that right? Right. Okay. And Unity Point Method or Unity Point Health Proctor. Proctor. Correct. Okay. Uh, and Unity Point is West Des Moines, Iowa based. Right. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about affordable care in just a moment, but first the affiliation between those two hospitals in Peoria. Uh, Proctor uh, was facing some financial difficulties. Uh, that's not a secret. Um, they had tried to sell their prompt care units, et cetera, to OSF, that fell through, and in came Methodist and uh, I guess Unity Point at that point also. Right. What, the affiliation, what does it mean in broad terms? Yeah, well it means that these two organizations can now work together as one, and we can look at healthcare and all the changes that are happening in healthcare as one entity, and adopt and adapt to the challenges that the region, the community will face in healthcare. Uh, and it gives us a chance to look at the services we provide and look for ways to strengthen those services, to expand those services. By bringing two, th two entities together, you find a lots of opportunities. And we're already finding some of those, so we're very excited about it. As a patient, if I'm with a PPO or some sort of an arrangement where Proctor was my preferred, it was my in-network mm -hmm. hospital, do I now have Methodist also, or how does that work? No, not today. You would have the same contracted network that your insurance plan has before we be affiliated. So if Methodist and Proctor are both in, which we are in many, you can choose either now and could have before. If Proctor is in but not Methodist, then you need to continue to choose Proctor. And if Methodist is in and not Proctor, you need to continue to choose Methodist. Over time, we hope to see many of that change. But that would be contractual with... Right, with the, the different payers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so d does that affect, like, doctor relationships? If a doctor has an affiliation with Proctor, d or is, is that all going to be merged? Merge might not be the right word, but... Well, all of the physicians are part of the UniPoint Health Methodist Proctor network now. So uh, many physicians have privileges at both organizations, both our employed physician group and independent physicians. So physicians will continue to practice pretty much how they are today, but certainly can use both facilities. And the first care, I believe they're called the first care centers that, uh -huh. that Proctor had, are those are going to remain open? Oh yes, definitely remain open. They're part of UniPoint Health Methodist Proctor affiliation. They're an important part of our delivery system along with our physician offices. So the two, we have Express Cares, both Methodist-based and the First Cares that are Proctor-based, now all available, which is one of the advantages of bringing together the two entities we're been, we can add to the access for patients. Let's turn to affordable care. We're in the new year, and by the way, welcome to the new year. Happy New Year to all of you. And with that, uh, Affordable Care Act, although it's been, I mean, portions of it have been brought uh, to the forefront over time. This really, this new year is the year that the big change occurs. Is there right. some sort of thumbnail sketch as to what's changed from two days ago? Well, I think I, before we talk about maybe the even some of the specific components, I want to just set the stage, if I could, by making the comment. So many people think that ja it's January 1st, it's the new year, 
all these changes are taking place. And I want to set the stage, and, and Debbie, I'm sure, you know, as we talk about it, we're in agreement. Really, when you look at where we are in health care today, when the Affordable Care Act, when that legislation was passed back in March of 2010, you had what started really immediately at that time. You had many of the, the hospitals, so the provider side, partnering with the physicians, and the managed care companies, so whether it's your, um, your, your, your Blue Cross of the world or even, even Medicare, starting to come together to look at a new way of providing care where we're really focusing on wellness prevention and managing care across the continuum. And I think so, there's so much confusion about the healthcare exchanges and what that means, and there's a lot of uncertainty even on the provider side for what that means. But the reassuring and I think the really great takeaway of all that we'll be talking about today Today is that this this is really an opportunity for the providers to focus on the care of the patient and to focus on how we coordinate care around the patient mm -hmm. which is very different than what we did even going back three years ago so I want to set the stage just with really a positive and I don't know Debbie other I, thoughts. I agree with that I think the opportunity for all the sections of health care the provider section the physician and the payer to begin to look at the patient at the center and look at how that patient's care can be coordinated differently and how the seamlessness for that patient can be enhanced, a real opportunity for patient care. Yeah. Let me take two aspects of what you just mentioned. One is health as yes. opposed to sickness. We are in fact talking about changing the way that we treat patients like by focusing on health care because I think traditionally hospitals, you're sick, you go to a hospital. We're not looking at it that way anymore. You'll still go to the hospital when you're sick and needing care, but what's important is that we're focusing on the health of the patient, the chronic Ill patient who needs uh, services coordinated, plan for prevention, a focus on wellness, assisting you to achieve the highest health you can. That will include sick care at times. But it is a different mindset when you're starting to think of the patient across their entire lifespan, starting to think about how you as a healthcare provider partnered with these others, other partners in the community, including physicians and payers, but also you know, local uh, nursing homes, community agencies, various people that actually are important to your health, coming together to really see how do we do a better job of assisting you to attain the highest health you can. And I think one of, you know, commenting going back in 2010 when we had the collaboration that really started the dialogue changed around coordinating care of the patient. We on the hospital side started working with our physicians on some very specific things. Obviously the most expensive place for a patient to receive care is the emergency department. And so we focused with our, our primary care physicians very specifically to have extended hours of care. So early morning appointments, late into the evening. Um, we're focused on having same day appointments. So if you're, for example, if you're a parent that works all day, you come home late afternoon, early into the evening, and you you've got a child that has a sinus infection, you're not going to let that your child suffer through the night um, if they've got a temperature and they're in a lot of pain. So historically, you would pick up and go to the emergency department because they would be there after hours. Now with whether it's immediate care or even extended hours in the physician's office, mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to get your patient in to be seen by the primary care physician, which is where that should be treated. So, but that also has been a change on the physician's part in terms of how they how they run their office and how they practice. But it really is care focused around what the patient, patient needs. Yeah, very patient centric. This this seems like there's an, an awful lot of coordination that has to take place because mm -hmm. if you'll excuse the use of the term. Methodist Medical Center, when it was Methodist Medical Center, <laughs> were, were operated in a silo, and if I may go back a few years, sure. Mennonite operated in a silo, Brokaw operated in a silo, and you are reaching out to long-term care facilities, to physicians, you're literally communicating with them to say, we need to offer a continuum mm -hmm. of care? Exactly. We are talking exactly that and talking about different t ways to partner to enhance that patient's experience. Much of that is contingent on information about the patient and being able to transfer and move information. And today that's much easier than it was in the past with electronic health systems and the different ways that they can integrate. 
we can create the picture of the patient across time and share that across time and develop goals for that patient across time and across different providers. So it's really a unifying picture for the patient. Uh, we call it care navigation, care coordination. Right. Um, we're really a much different focus on those types of activities than there were five years ago, three years ago. And I think, you know, in the old world where the, the, the focus was on volume, yes. more and more volume, more patients, more procedures, that's how more the reimbursement things. system worked. Now we're switching to really value. How do you manage care across the continuum? Right. How do you manage the care of those individuals with those chronic diseases across the continuum? So the physician office, the outpatient setting, the hospital side, home care, the nursing home. How do we coordinate that in a way that we're providing the the best value for the, the patient. And part of that, which is kind of contrary to the world that we live in, is how do we work to keep the patient out of the hospital? So it's a very different dialogue than it was even going back three or four years ago. Shame on you for saying that. <laughs> Your board of directors will be talking about um, that. They're but, on board too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but you, you're talking about this electronic transfer of information so that you don't duplicate services, you have the most recent information so that you don't, if there's an allergy and you're not prescribing a medicine that might uh, be, that patient might be allergic to. So is this, uh, how does like Central Illinois Health Information Exchange, CHI, right. is that working into this or is that a first step? So I would characterize that as really a first step that there's the opportunity for us to exchange information region, from a regional, regional perspective. So if a patient is in a facility in Peoria or one in Eureka or one in Bloomington, Decatur, we have the opportunity to make sure that that information gets, gets mm. exchanged. Mm -hmm. And so if a patient shows up in the emergency department, you've got the ability to pull up what was done at another hospital a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, I think the challenge comes, how do we look at it more from a national perspective really, I think, is the important conversation that needs to begin. Exactly. And as patients and how their health care is paid for changes, and when uh, companies are deciding to, uh, to sponsor certain centers of excellence for patients, that conversation that la allows exchange of information nationally will increasingly be right. important, I think. And if you think about it, oftentimes when a patient, we're looking for the patient to be able to tell us what yeah. did you have done, what were your test results. So if they, if they had a CT scan done somewhere you know, three weeks ago, they show up in another emergency department or in another setting, we're looking to the patient to say, what's your diagnosis, what do you have, what was done, and oftentimes um, they don't they, know. They don't know. So we repeat yeah. that scan, right? We do it again, and we've just duplicated. If, if we had that information available, we would not have had to duplicate to mm -hmm. duplicate that scan. And that adds cost to the delivery of the health care. Uh, be because the Affordable Care Act is still an, an evolutionary process, mm -hmm. it has to make it difficult for you to budget. And as the chief executive officer at your respective uh, medical centers, how do you go about doing that? How do you say, well, we've got so many people that have transferred from no care to the state exchanges or the federal exchange, and we used to get reimbursed for Medicaid, we used to get, how do you go about setting a budget? Well, we use the information we know. There are certain assumptions you have to make, and we run different scenarios so that you can begin to get ranges of how much things are going to change. Um, this year, though, coming in, um, that exchange, slow, you know, just start. We're going to have time to observe and assess what's happening there so that we can better adjust, you know, in 2015 and get more prescriptive budgeting. But I've been reading quite a bit about hospitals, particularly healthcare systems, really having to do a lot more scenario planning than we've ever had to do in the past. So you are looking at different ways in which the reimbursement could change and you're looking at different ways in which sustainability, your planning for the future could impact. So it's, yeah, the CFOs are challenged for sure, um, but it, you do have information that you can help make some scenario planning work and that's what we've been doing and I'm sure all others are doing. Right, I think we do know that more are moving from maybe an uninsured status to Medicaid. To Medicaid. 
So there's some assumptions to your point being made about what that looks like. Right. Um, and I think with the exchanges and all of the confusion around even the enrollment and, and um, we're making some assumptions there. Um, thankfully, it's a much smaller number than, than even we would have anticipated earlier on. So mm -hmm. it gives us the opportunity to do some modeling to understand maybe where we well, had a patient yeah. in a different plan and they've now moved to an exchange plan. What are the, what are the consumers mm -hmm. choosing as they're out there on the exchange? So the slow transition actually is good for yes, you? Yes, very much actually so. Actually, it okay. is for, for, for us to adopt yes. mm -hmm. and adapt. Let's talk a couple of a about a couple of aspects of the Affordable Care Act and, and ACOs, affordable care organizations. And if I understand this correctly, it's where hospitals and physicians, what have you, combine to make sure that 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 patients the patient treatment hits a certain level from quality yes from, and from, access mm -hmm. and uh, a certain level of coordination um, the accountable care organization is really doing what we talked about earlier looking at that patient across time coordinating across time and working to hit certain outcome measures that are described as being high quality outcomes and together you know partnering with physicians um, that pressure to find uh, innovative ways to deliver care uh, can happen. And we're seeing some very unique ways of managing high-risk patients that in the past those patients would be coming back in, back in, back in, either through the emergency room or through an admission, finding ways to manage and help them maintain their care in their home. And so less costly settings, maybe having home care assistance, but the accountable care organization allows you to work together to try to figure out how to do that better. And it's all, it also goes back to our initial discussion around really wellness and prevention. prevention right. And it is, it's focusing on certain things in physician offices that the primary care, even the OBGYN or the cardiologist, should be screening for exactly. and, and having a dialogue on an ongoing basis. And it's helping to incentivize those physicians to really focus on some of those core components that are, are ev best evidence-based practice medicine. Is, is the ACO part of the effort to try to reduce the readmittance rate? Be, because there is a penalty. Yes. If, right. if a medical center has so many patients, a certain percentage of patients readmitted within 30 days, there's a penalty. Is that right? Correct. Mm -hmm. and, Correct. And so the ACO is a way to say, we're working together to try to reduce that readmittance rate and improve treatment. Right. And I think the nice part when you look at, and I know both of our organizations are a part of the Medicare Shared Savings Accountable Care Organization partnering with Medicare through our, our respective entities, and we do know which patients we are now accountable for right. um, to really look at how do we do, how do we work across the continuum to coordinate that care. Let me list some of the changes, financial changes, and have you react in terms of budgetary. Medicare Part A, well, we don't know when it's going to go bankrupt, but unless they change some things, it's going to be soon. So the Affordable Care Act includes 500 million to 700, I'm sorry, billion, billion. 500 billion to 700 billion in spending reductions. Some of that will be on the backs of hospitals. Is that correct? It's anticipated that we will have an, a continuing erosion, as they call it, to the reimbursement rates from Medicare. And the, there's going to be a cut in Medicare disproportionate share hospital payments by $22 billion starting this year for the next 10 years. And an independent payment advisory board is going to cut Medicare reimbursement by $14.7 billion over 10 years. The medical and surgical specialty reimbursement 6% over th uh, a year over three years. Goodness <laughs> gracious. Oh, well, that's how well, we feel. Yeah. <laughs> Just how you said it. <laughs> well, uh, how are you going to, first of all, I expect excellent care when I come to your facility. As or you should, your facility. as you should. Absolutely. And if you have to meet or, or, or accommodate all these kinds of cuts in payment, Am I going to get good care? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, we are all looking at ways to, um, to be innovative in how we provide care to focus. We do know if you focus on wellness and prevention, you're not spending as much even on the, on the back end. We're not spending as much. We talked about the health insurance the information um, with the, the health uh, 
information record and being able to reduce the duplication. You're seeing a lot of consolidation right now nationally the mm -hmm. in the healthcare industry, and that's an opportunity to really look at economies of scale and how you have size and scale to be able to um, take advantage of, of being a larger organization, whether that means consolidations from a billing and collection, from a purchasing power standpoint, we're all looking at ways how we can reduce our total cost of delivering health care. You mentioned the word consolidation. Uh, Debbie, I'd like you to, to talk a little bit. And, and, and of course, Colleen, you can jump in because you have a rural hospital uh, right. in your, uh, that you oversee. But we know that some rural hospitals have closed. Whitehall used to have a hospital, small town, but Whitehall 10, 15 years ago had to close their, their hospital. There are other examples across, where, across the state where rural facilities closed. And you have smaller hospitals down in Havana, Mason District, Eureka Hospital, a small hospital. Does consolidation mean that rural residents might not get, might not have access to health care that they've become accustomed to? Well, it really depends on those small rural hospitals and how they, how financially strong they are today and what changes in partnering and movement they're making to prepare for the future. They are under a lot of pressure. I mean, big organizations are under a lot of pressure, so small organizations clearly are. Um, there is, a, I know in the country, a desire for health care to be s local, to serve the local needs and not have people have to travel long distances for care. And that pressure, I think, will continue, that right. the citizens of uh, this country want local health care. Um, so those organizations are looking for partners and looking for affiliations that can assist them to make it through that financial future that's coming and still be able to provide local care. Let me put it directly to you. You're the president of Advocate Eureka. Right. What are the prospects, the financial prospects for Eureka Hospital mm -hmm. remaining a viable and, and offering at least a, a, a a wide perspective of services. Right, so we're very optimistic and are continuing to look at the growth of services at Eureka. Um, to Debbie's point, healthcare, you know, is, is really local. Um, mm -hmm. And I do believe that, that services that can be provided in a community should be provided in a community. So we're continuing to really increase the number of specialists from our Bromen, from Advocate Bromen, that go over to Eureka and provide clinics over there, do surgeries over there. Um, they've got a, a, on the inpatient side even with the skilled care along with the inpatient so we're continuing to see strong volumes at Eureka um, and obviously for more of those tertiary procedures those patients would would go to a larger medical center but um, there is you know there's a, a those rural organizations are an important part economically. Mm -hmm. They are economic engines of their community. In most cases, they are the largest employers. Um, and so it is important that, that we continue to have a dialogue around the future of, of, of critical access hospitals for Eureka um, and in other rural communities. It's, uh, both Proctor and Methodist are in Peoria, but are we going to see, uh, Colleen mentioned the, you know, we're gonna have specialists come over to Eureka from Broman. Will there be some of that where Methodists, someone who's a specialist at Methodist now can go to Proctor and someone who is a specialist at Proctor go to Methodist? Oh yes, definitely. That's one of the things that we will be focusing strongly on in 2014 here, to really look at opportunities for the patients to have access on either campus, on either physician network, and where um, opportunity is to expand specialist services, we will look to do that as well. So yes, we will see that. Uh, a final thought, and this is in the workforce arena. Uh, is there the possibility that with the changes that are occurring that the, the, the number of nurses or even physicians mm. might be, and I know there's a benefit, we have University of Illinois College of Medicine, Peoria, and we have OSF and Methodist, both with nursing uh, schools. But what about the shortage? We, every, everything I read says there's going to be a shortage. How are you going to accommodate that? Of nurses? Of nurses. 
uh, well, in our community, and I think in central Illinois, we've been very blessed because yes, there are, are so many colleges of nursing, um, and because the quality of life is so good in central Illinois, we're able to retain and keep many of those nurses right. within our communities. I think the exciting part for those who are interested in the nursing profession is there are so many different avenues that nurses can, um, so many different types of, of health care they can provide or different settings they can practice their skills. I actually think that we're going to continue to see more individuals individuals really have an interest in going into nursing in the future. And it might not be in a hospital setting. Oh, absolutely, maybe not. <laughs> I think more and more care will be delivered in other settings, and nursing is really very well prepared as a profession to provide care in the community and in home settings. So I think the future for nursing, I think, is very positive, and we're lucky for it locally because yes. I think we do have some great colleges here. There's so much more that we can talk about with <laughs> health care and the changes that the Affordable Care Act are bringing uh, but some of those we can't even discuss because we don't really we know. know. Exactly. So would it be alright if I invite the two of you back uh, let's say a year from now and, and, and look back and see mm -hmm. where we've been? Uh, thank you to Colleen Canada, who is the president of both uh, Advocate Broman in Bloomington and Advocate Eureka in Eureka. Right, thank you. And thank you to Debbie Simon, who is president and CEO of both uh, Unity Point Health Methodist and Unity Point Health Proctor. Very and I, I know thank both you. of you are busy with two yep. facilities to take care of. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you for joining us in the new year here on At Issue. We invite you to join us one week from now when we're going to be talking about suicide prevention. Uh, we'll talk about uh, PATH in Bloomington. We'll talk about Children's Home and the Holt Center for Health Education providing services for uh, suicide prevention. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. We'll see you in 168 hours.